So, all right. Like you said, what are Wednesdays and stuff? It's just, we have no proof to say, okay, this is Wednesday. Right. We just say, we wake up and we say, okay, today is Sunday, tomorrow is going to be Monday. If someone comes to argue with us and be like, why does it have to be Monday? Why can't it be Thursday or Saturday? No, no, the Sunday? question isn't that. The question is, what is, no, I know. A, what is a Monday? Yeah, I, I know what I'm just saying. We have no proof to say this is for certain Monday. That, that is what I was getting at. Right. It's just a convention, right? Yes. Now, why? What is it made up of? Well, it's it emerges from relationships between things. Does that make sense? Yes. It's organized complexity. Now, the same with a nationality. What is a nationality, right? Yes. Well, it you can't, it's not a thing, but it's... Um, a you can define it as the country where you're coming from, but this is more deeper than just the country you're from. Yeah, because you could spend a lot of time in that country and not, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what is, well, there's the difference between race as a physical gene and race as a cultural concept, right? Yes. And what is race as a cultural? I mean, the so the genetic race as genetic is minute. Race in a culture is huge, right? So it's an entirely different thing, right? Does that make sense? Yes. What is it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's what he's saying is that we basically live in a world of holes. We don't live in a world of parts. We live in a world of organized complexity, concepts. Yes. We live in a world of concepts, but that doesn't mean they're not real. And that doesn't yes. mean they're not causal. And it doesn't mean they're disembodied like Kant. They don't exist in some, you know, transcendent space. So they actually question, function the way we live. What, go ahead. I was going to ask a question. So you said, he said the world is a whole. So could it be said that everything is somehow connected then if it's all a whole instead of different parts? Is, is that what is being implied there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. That's what he's saying that organized complexity. I don't know if you read that little um, news editorial, but um, scientists actually believe that the laws of physics fit together into a whole, right? Yeah, but they don't have any evidence for that, yes. right? Um, also, like, I've never thought it, he talks as if physicists think laws cause things, and I don't think laws cause things. I think laws are a tool of the mind to understand patterns in the world. And because the, the universe is ordered, we can articulate what's called laws, but the laws aren't causal, <laughs> right? The laws don't cause that order. The order causes the laws. Does that make laws, sense? Yeah, laws yes. just explain it. What? Laws just explain things. It's right. They come up with a law after it's been tested and tested and tested. Exactly, and just it, like Newton's law. It hasn't been disproven, so we go with that as being cement, you know, until somebody manages to come up with something more true, I guess. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's just an explanation. I try to, when I'm reading books by physicists, it's as if they're training ever since they were little. They think of concepts as causes rather than measuring what's in the biological world, right? They have separated their mind from the natural world so early on that they actually think laws cause things, yeah. which I, 
it's just bizarre to me. But then these books are trying to argue people out of it. And I thought, I always think I never thought that in the first place. Um, I don't remember, Warren, you might remember. It was one of the psychology classes. We actually had to distinguish between laws, theories, hypotheses, because people do. They make that, like they get them confused. They think they're all the same thing. So we actually had to go through and learn what was what, what it meant to be a law. It might have been research methods. I'm not sure. Probably yeah. is research methods. Yeah. The law of gravity. <laughs> is that a cause? The law isn't the cause. Exactly. It's there. <laughs> right. Gravity is there. He, it's not like he came up with the law of gravity out of thin air and then gravity happened. And so Mr. Davies in that editorial, he asked, well, why? Why is it we can formulate these laws? Why is it they fit together? And so he, uh, we didn't read any of this, but he actually thinks there's a cosmic blueprint, right? Way back, there was some mind of God that set up the conditions and then lets it go. So it's not any traditional notion of God. It's not any anthropomorphized or anything like that. It's actually a lot more like Aristotle. But, but let's go with what is mind or what is soul. That's what we really want to learn, right? Yes. And so the answer to that is it's, it doesn't, it's not a thing. It's a holistic concept. Yeah, it's abstract. But it doesn't mean, therefore, it's not real. Right. And it doesn't mean it's not causal. Um, as a matter of fact, this is what it means to say we are creatures of culture. We literally recreate our biology, not entirely. That's where the Enlightenment thought they could do it absolutely entirely. But we definitely do it. We have conversations with each other about holistic concepts. Again, what is justice? Is it, can you touch it or, you know? No, it's no. abstract. It's an abstraction, right? And it's supposed to refer to particular behaviors or particulars, but nobody agrees on the particulars, right? Does that make sense? But it's a real concept and it, it exerts uh, agency, people act on the basis of an idea of justice. Um, but justice is not itself any one thing, or, I mean, it's the person, who, it's the pattern of information in the mind of somebody looks and sees a pattern and calls that justice or just, right? And somebody else has a very different idea of what kind of pattern should be modeled justice. And then somebody else disagrees on whether the stuff in front of them is exhibiting this pattern or that pattern. Does that, does that make sense to all of you? Yeah. Yes. And then does it make sense that basically your mind is what's governing you, even though it's not a thing at all? It's an emergent property. Yes, it makes sense. Okay. Um, and okay, Alicia, what did you want to comment on? Uh, I actually did. It really just reminded me a lot of um, something that we debated in a controversies class, which was is mental illness a mental or a biological issue? And I did a whole bunch of looking into, now I ended up not using it in the debate because it's not, it wasn't what we were basing our points on, but I looked into what the mind and soul, what not the soul, but what the mind really is. Um, and so basically what I think, you know, is the mind or the mind soul is the complete part that that is our whole self. 
And, you know, our, my, our body, that is a component of that. Even though the body is the only thing that is physical, you know, it, it's like trying to diagnose where a thought came from. You can't do that. A thought is something that we create with our brain, but it doesn't have a physical form. So I just, it's really hard to put into words. Well, um, so sometimes, and where do those thoughts come from, right? Mm -hmm. So a strict determinist would say, if you could find out every single stimulus, blah, 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 you could actually predict behavior. But that's just an act of faith and there's no real reason to believe that. Right. Um, but it is true that if you get hit by a blue car, right, you have a trauma, you might have a reaction every time you see a blue car, right, that nobody else will have. <laughs> and so, you know, to some extent, the associations we make are different. Mm -hmm. Well, then you get a, to a higher level of complexity and you start, um, I mean, the COVID thing is very interesting, like, the government restrictions on um, movement before the vaccine, right? And the government demands to wear a mask, right? So that's a cultural product. Um, and some people interpreted that to mean, oh, this is authoritarianism, right? This is fascism. This is someone's trying to control me and trying to make me into some sort of mindless tool for their power, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody else says, oh, that's just how democracy should run anyway. We shouldn't even be have to told that, have to be told that because we should care about each other's health and we should care about each other and we should want kids to get back to school so we should do what we need to do. All right, so, so number one, is everybody convinced we are creatures of culture? Yes. Okay, that's number one. Number two, is it because of your biology that you interpret it one way or the other? Um, I don't think so. I mean, at the, the I mean, the most sympathetic would be that somehow you got fear, the amalgam or whatever, your fear instinct got attached to, I hate government, you know, whatever it is, if it's government, it's bad. <laughs> Whereas somebody else got, oh, the common good, good, right? But still, you know, even if that happened, you can think your way out of that, right? You can say, you know, I grew up with this association and I just disagree with that. I've changed my mind, right? And so your mind is your idea of the good and people's ideas of the good or the just are definitely culturally, culturally based interpretations of what's going on. And ultimately they are efforts to civilize us, right? To prevent the aggression and the um, impulsiveness, because that undermines culture. So every cultural product has some connection to instinctual drives. It can't totally reconstruct it. But after that, it's a free-for-all, right? And what drives us are thought, thoughts cause thoughts, which could, which I think, Warren, goes back to Damasio, right? Thought causes, cause thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Can so I that's, you, go can ahead. I read you something that it made me, it made me think of something I had read before um, from, well, Polkinghorn, you know Polkinghorn. That's right. As, I, as a matter of fact, Davies is in that interview with Polkinghorn in that other, in that other book. Is he? Yeah. Maybe that's why he seemed a little familiar with me, to me. Right. Okay, anyway, um, talking about kind of what his cosmic blueprint is, he explained that God created the universe, 
but that he said but this was not a one act invention of a clockwork world god did something more clever he created a world with independence a world able to make itself creation is an ongoing act one in which the laws of nature make room for choice and action both human and divine he finds this idea beautifully affirmed by the best parts of chaos theory which describes reality in an interplay between order and disorder between mm -hmm. possibilities and pattern so he's i mean going beyond the mind body you know physical spiritual connection he is saying that it does not have to be science or religion it's both oh. and right. so anyway it just that's what another thing I, that it reminded me of so right i mean i thought you would like this reading because that reading in that class is more about the universe yeah this one is about how your how your mind develops and yeah. that it can connect the natural object is that ultimate good yeah right but it's because of that order ordered complexity that's what made evolution the evolution of the human uh capacity to understand that's what made it possible right there had to be something to be understood before this creature is going to evolve that understands, right? It's just like there had to be something visible before the power of sight would evolve. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. I mean, you know, the power of sight doesn't just erupt and then invent some object of sight out there. We don't really know if it really exists. <laughs> no, I mean, the world was visible eventually evolution went that way why because it was successful so the creature with the power of sight had, was more fit right and they survived and so the creature with the power to understand the patterns has been very successful the trouble is as soon as you know that you know you have choice and then you can choose anything and you can choose in a way that's self-destructive because you can separate yourself from your origins. You can even deny your origins and you can deny that there's a natural object of thought, which is a universe that's ordered. And we ought to limit ourselves to living within those basic forces. But you can deny that you have a choice. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, hi, Ivy. Can you, um, the other thing is, does it make sense that free will is just an emergent property? As soon as you are aware that you are aware, right? As soon as you're aware of your awareness, you're aware of your power of choice because then, then you have to actually have reasons for choosing one thing or another. And so it, then it just becomes more and more complex. Um, Ivy, what did you get out of this reading? Um, we're talking about Davies, right? Yeah. Okay, so I found it interesting um, that he was questioning how if our mind can outlive our body and he talked of uh, thoughts as if they had a world of their own and they triggered our um, interactions and everything and uh, we get that from interacting through the outside where it's kind of a give and take relationship um, and so like if fire if we touch fire and it burns we know not to touch it in the future you know type thing um, yet the notion of reality is faith because we only know it's real if we experience it if that makes sense so like i don't know well um, actually what he's saying is that it goes way beyond experience right i mean thoughts cause thoughts so your soul is a concept it emerges from experience does that make sense 
Uh, okay, maybe I didn't get from okay, this reason so why I thought I was. He compares it with the computer, right? The hardware. Yes. So there's the hardware and the software. And so your brain does have the circuitry in it and you can study the circuitry and it mm -hmm. goes by cause effect, but your mind is operates on a different at a different level. So you're going to Ed's and you're deciding whether to have ice cream or not. And you're thinking about this and that, but your neurons are not, you know, hesitating, right? But you're hesitating because you're thinking about, I don't, whatever you think about calories or whatever, or being too full for practice, right? You think about all that stuff. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is culturally constructed, right? I mean, calories are not, except that our attitudes toward them are. There's a very so just, a big difference between hunger and appetite, right? People want to eat for a lot of reasons other than being hungry. And um, there, there are artificial ways. I mean, the foods we eat create an artificial hunger that's socially constructed because of the sugar levels going up and down. I mean, it's pretty crazy the way we're, we're messing with our bodies, but, but appetite is different than hunger. Does that make so is sense? He, is he saying that our mind is like separate from our bodies? Yeah. It's oh, a concept, okay. right? It's a holistic, I mean, it depends on them. But then, like you said, and he he ended it asking if we could um, transfer our souls into something, which I don't think that would be possible because it's intangible, if that makes sense. Like we'd be able to give a machine our thoughts and everything, but it wouldn't really be our consciousness. OK, um, but could you picture thoughts causing thoughts, right, mm -hmm. that that it doesn't necessarily have to be transferred into a machine, I don't think, mm -hmm. right? because it doesn't- I thought of it as like a child, you know? How you give your, a child um, your thoughts and they kind of process those as they will, if I'm making sense. Well, actually you might tell your kid to do this or do that or feed them this or that, but you have an idea in your head of what the good, of why, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you're molding your kid according to a certain idea of the good. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, okay. In a yeah. machine, I, I was thinking it would essentially do that as well. Like it would give and take. You know how Laszlo was talking about um, consciousness not being such a uniquely human quality right. because mm -hmm. it can be manufactured? I think Davies here was kind of talking about manufacturing an artificial intelligence based on the possibility okay. of transferring a human consciousness into a mechanical, like a mechanically generated yeah. process. And I don't think that a machine, now you might be able to program a machine to run on to run a program based on everything that happened in my life mm -hmm. and what happened because of each interaction, what the consequences were, what the causes were. But once it gets to the end of that program, is that AI going to then respond the same way I would have? Or is it going to develop different ideas you see it can only be me up until the point that I stopped mm -hmm. feeding ideas into that program because then the ideas have to come from somewhere else so I don't agree with him I don't think that a consciousness can be transferred from a human body into a mechanical mind Right. Did he say it had to be a mechanical? I mean, okay. he was speaking. Yeah. I, I think mean, that's I what he was. Trying it, to I can see it outliving 
the body, but not yeah. the form of a machine. <laughs> well, I mean, and if it outlived my body, okay, if it goes into another biological. Well, it shouldn't be biological, though. It should be, right. What is, it's a holistic concept. Ideas cause ideas. Okay, That's so the mind just, hard. the mind just still exists. Mm -hmm. right. Cosmos somewhere, maybe. Right. Okay, I, then is he saying that the mind, all of these leftover minds cause something? Well, like they connect and it's a great cosmic knowledge or something. Well, I don't energy know. isn't created or destroyed. So that's my thoughts on that. Oh, okay. So the consciousness remains. Is that what you're thinking, Ivy? Yes. Okay. And then the question is, does it reincarnate anywhere or is it just uh, it doesn't I mean believe it does, but as far as um, this reading, I don't believe that what, what Alicia was saying, you can transfer your consciousness to a machine because when I'm done, when I die, the machine essentially dies and someone else right. would have to transfer their cells. It well, wouldn't be me anymore. I don't think he said it has to be transferred into a machine. I think, I don't remember. Maybe it was metaphorical. <laughs> But it was the machine that was the underpinnings of this emergence of consciousness. Yeah. But then it could exist, continue without any, I mean, the way I think of it is if you really want to scare yourself into behaving, that you would have to live for eternity with all those thoughts, your whole, the consciousness that you had when you were embodied except that now you don't have all those, you know, all the things you had to cope with that led you to that, but you still have to live with your <laughs> jealousy and all that crap. And um, that would scare you into behaving, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think he personally thinks it's possible, but I don't think, I don't remember him ever saying it had to be back into another machine. But, I think maybe he, I, well, I don't, I don't think he said that. I was just like going off of <laughs> uh, Ivy's comment. I was just trying to like make a mental picture. Make sure. it make sense for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the consciousness in his opinion, it lives on and it is still effectual in the people that we came into contact with during our lives because they remember what we said and what we did and what we thought. Mm -hmm. So it still has impact. As long as somebody refers to that when they are making their own opinions and actions, like, right. like a legacy of our consciousness. That's what the yes. Greeks care about, yeah. right? What's the story that you're gonna leave behind? Yeah. And people will tell stories about you. What is the story you wanna leave behind? But there's Hades and there's Persephone. And then Persephone is the one that uses the most irrational. It uses pleasure to try to get to people behave. But that's irrational. That doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, to have consciousness in without a body and still experience pleasure, <laughs> no. I mean, that's the reason why it's a good thought experiment to think well, what do I want my consciousness to be and not be driven by all this bodily stuff? Like the bodily stuff shouldn't be the cause. I shouldn't just be reacting. I should be active, right? Not reactive. Um, so that's what the trauma, the trauma guy, right? Somebody is caught up in something that happened that they didn't control, but it's physical and it made a physical impression in their brain. And it is driving their behavior. They can't help it. Like they can't outthink it, right? So it has to be uncovered so that that particular hardware, right? That connection gets broken. And then the power of ideas, but it has to be some combination of remembering it maybe a drug for a little while just to ease up on the connection but ultimately you have to get a different set of ideas 
to move on, right? That's where theater, music, this stuff isn't just healing the wound, it's actually forming communities, it's forming a life history without the trauma, right? But again, that's very much holistic. That's, you have an idea of the good, community is good, binding people together is culture, but that creates a whole level of culture that's not, you can't explain it in terms of the hardware. Does that make sense? What you're saying is reminded me of something I came across in, uh, oh, I think world religions when we were studying indigenous peoples. Um, some of the Native American peoples would not or did not want to commit their stories, their customs and traditions to writing because doing so took away its power, its purpose. It was in the, the passing from what the knowledge, the passing of the knowledge from one person to the next that, that the power of you know, who they were continued. Does that kind of, that well, maybe- Well, not only that, when you write it down, somebody else can misinterpret it. Right. Okay. They can deliberately abuse it. Right. Or they can, they project themselves into it and interpret it in a way you didn't mean. Oh yeah, there's real problems with the written word. Mm -hmm. But that again, it, it, there's an explosion of culture, right? When the written word emerges in history, all of a sudden, culture becomes a whole lot more complex. It does. Just access to, like, even if it had been written down before, but in, for example, the Bible, the Latin Vulgate, nobody could read it. But the printing press comes out and it gets put into German and French and all of this, and everybody knows what it says now. And then That's you have the Protestant. Huge, yeah, you have this huge change. So. Yeah, and there's 40 different kinds of Baptists in Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but every one of them thinks every word in the Bible is true, except that you're totally wrong about what it says. I mean, I it blows my mind. I can't, I cannot, but that's culture. Culture enables you to just sort of think anything. Um, so the software can get totally detached from the hardware, right? Yeah. Um, so here's another question that's happened since Davies has written, right? Okay, let's go with Facebook and social media, right? Uh, okay, now just think about that, that there's the hardware there that's working very well, way too well, right? The algorithms, they work incredibly well, but the software, what's emerging from it, right, is you, you know, anybody's guess. Um, the, the one big problem is when the algorithm, when it's based on fear, right? Like the whole, every, everything you're exposed to, you somehow went down a rabbit hole and got in an algorithm where tapping into fear is sort of the algorithm, right? Like every, all the inputs you get are that same thing. And then that's where the machine taps into some pretty primitive part of your brain, but still you're interpreting it, right? So um, if you have the fear button and you say, that's why the liberals are evil, you know, <laughs> or you have the fear button, that's why the conservatives are evil, right? It can be any inference at all. It's just that tapping the fear thing is the way that that machine has been programmed with greed in mind, right? So there's somebody programming this stuff who also has an idea of the good, which is to get rich, right? And that's a cultural thing that's successful. So you get someone like Mark Zuckerberg. This is, he's a classic. He's just like Damasio, right? He thought, wow. I'm giving this great gift to humanity and everybody can be in contact with their friends. Does everybody understand this? He's just like Damasio. 
and um and it hasn't worked out like somebody could have told him this is not going to go the way you think it's going to go you know it's going to get reductionistic for the sake of making money and then it's someone could have told him mr zuckerberg what are you going to do because that is going to happen are you going to let your you know all this hardware just keep persisting even when if you have the money uh money motive those most basic instincts are going to be tapped over and over and over and then people are either going to become much more impulsive or they're going to be finding someone to blame and what i mean you could have predicted that well then mark zuckerberg also gave a bundle of his money to neuroscience like <laughs> Like we can, we, I mean, he really thought, well, we can fix the brain and so that to cure you of aggression and violence and addiction, we'll do all that with the neuroscience. And then everybody can do Facebook and be happy dappy or do you see what I mean that he was blind about that? Because he kept focusing on the brain as the solution without thinking about the fact that ideas are really what's going to drive the hardware, the Facebook, the neuroscience. If, okay, I got to stop there. I have to see, everybody should just have some reaction to how the stuff is starting, is fitting together. That's what I was thinking. Go ahead, Alicia. Um, I'm sorry, how it's fitting together with the last few things like we have Damasio. Um, let me go back. Let's see to um, before Damasio. Okay, we had Von der Koch, right? Trauma. And how he kept saying we were approaching this level where we were going to think at this higher level about culture and about community. And then the, the strict brain reductionist folks came in there and had their elect, electrodes to the brain solution. Or then we were starting to work out this, again, this fits with Davies, this more holistic view of mind, thoughts cause thought. We were setting up the arts and then this whole bunch of drugs came in. Oh no, one of them was the diagnostic manuals that just look at behavior and don't look at thoughts, right? Those yeah, things came yeah. in, tons of money was made. Then we're trying to recover from that. And again, we go into theater, we start doing all this other stuff including that imagery where the person has to deliberately think thoughts that make that thing on the screen go down, right? So they're literally having to go to a higher level. He, they can see that it's having a physical component, but they have to be doing something mentally. They have to be thinking differently in order to get the little needle, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So literally you are doing that. You are getting to a higher conceptual level and it's working because the machine is showing you that the thoughts are more important so and then all of a sudden you get these opioids you know that are going to save the world so mr De, uh, von der Koch, i think would agree that the mind is at this realm where thoughts cause thoughts and that and when even when you have trauma it doesn't have to be causal the rest of your life, but you do have to flesh it out so you can have integrity, so that you can integrate it, recognize it, flush it, flush it just process it. Um, and once you do that, then you can move on, but you do need to have community, right? In the arts, you have to have all this other stuff. Just like you can't release someone from prison without a job, without housing, without any, any alternative 
way to start restructuring the way they think about life, the whole holistic. We have a very reductionistic view of prison life, right? You did naughty, you get punished, right? And that's it. And he's saying, you know, that 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 is ridiculous. That's like a kid that gets trauma, traumatized is yelled at all the time. It just completely makes them incapable of moving to that higher level. Um, so then Damasio says, yeah, we've rejected reductionism, we've rejected dualism, and now thoughts cause thoughts, and now we want homeostasis, and how do you get it? Well, you can contemplate God, you can go into institutional religion isn't so bad if it's a community, except that, <laughs> then he says, and the drugs will cure everything. <laughs> And it doesn't occur to him that institutional religion, in order for people to feel secure, a lot of times they have to say, it's those other people over there. It's those Muslims that are threatening my homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So I have to bomb them and then I'll have homeostasis, right? He doesn't yeah. think about that. So he hasn't, he's right about thoughts cause thoughts, but he's, his idea, <laughs> of what thoughts to have. And also that's completely contradicts drugs will save us from aggression and violence and depression and all that. And that nature is terrible and evil just because we die, totally ridiculous. Um, and so this week we have um, Laszlo talking, this is the holistic stuff, but it's based on the whole universe and how the universe has emerged, right? And so Laszlo talks about holistic thinking and it's, it's organized complexity. It goes to higher and higher levels of complexity. And actually, I, I forgot with Alicia and Ivy and Warren, I did want to ask you what you thought of his view of religion at the end um, of that reading. Remember last time um, you hadn't gotten to it yet. So we'll talk about that. And then Davies is comes in and he's talking about that the mind is a concept. It's a holistic concept, but thoughts cause thoughts. It's another realm. And so reductionistic causality, it's not your hardware that's causing you to not be able to figure out what to have for dinner, <laughs> your minds. Um, so he's rejecting reductionism and he's rejecting dualism. Um, so that's the way it all fits together. Does, uh, do you understand that now better that we had? Yeah, my you asked me that in my brain, just like. I'm sure everybody's did because. <laughs> oh, no, no. Yeah. So no. the way the course works, right? We had the more holistic view in the ancients. Then we reject, then we had the supernatural. St. Thomas comes in and says, you must not use birth control because it's a naughty, naughty. And you know, and you want to go to heaven. So then that gets splits off from nature very much in the culture we live in. That's just really repressive, right? It's difficult to have integrity. Um, and then we had the moderns with John Locke, the blank slate. And we had the utilitarian. So we have that reductionistic view. All we do is change the outside world, observe behaviors, change the outside world, and people will respond like herd animals differently. And then we had the dualistic view, Kant and Descartes, they're totally split. And then we had these people nowadays, the, the, all this stuff that's coming out, the trauma studies, the neuroscience, but we still have this conflict, right? So now all these other things are rejecting dualism, rejecting uh, reductionism, talking about mind as a holistic concept. And, but even Mr. Davies in these readings doesn't talk about community, right? Our minds are related to us as a social and political being, right? It's a holistic concept, but he doesn't, his examples are like Wednesdays, symphonies, but what about communities? 
communities are holes, right? And so many people's entire lives, it's not separable from some community, it's from relationships. Um, so it's not just your, your thoughts causing thoughts. It's you engaged in social political life and creating a worldview that really is a bunch of thoughts. Um, all right, so does that answer your confusion, Alicia? Alicia? Yeah, I just couldn't figure out where to start. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, no, I definitely can connect him to Laszlo and how Laszlo was talking about, you know, once we got to where we were building a culture, we kind of took over our own evolutionary process. Yes. Um, because our actions are working off of these ideas, which create new ideas and new actions and, and things like that. Um, and obviously to Vanderkolk, who, you know, people who have been traumatized, their ideas are going to produce, their minds are going to produce different ideas for one. And then they're going to produce different actions than, like if you take the idea of a traumatized person and give it to somebody who has not experienced trauma, the two people would act on that same idea in very different ways. Um, and what I think about their views of religion, it's actually kind of beautiful because they, they explain how, you know, thinking this and believing this does not have to go against religion. They, they weave it together and show that, you know, this is, there's still room for religion here. Right. And I, when I see that, it's always, and I think that's why I, I liked Tippett's book so much, or the one you gave us, oh, yeah. I don't know, three or four years ago. Einstein's God. Yeah, Einstein's God, because the, the interviews in that book do the same thing. Right. I'm a scientist, but there is still so much room for God, There's, or, or religion. Um, and seeing how people weave their ideas of religion into the other beliefs that they have is I really enjoy seeing that so I thought you would like it yeah um so one more I'll call I'll call on Ivy and oh my gosh okay but in this way in this again is a similarity with Damasio Religion means binding and integrating of people in communities. That's what Damasio says. But the religion community has to ha be based on that humanistic and ecumenical branch of that religion. That's how you avoid tribalism and using yeah. religion as a weapon, right? right? And Damasio just didn't say that. He said, well, I meant that. And I say, you didn't say it, buddy. And that yeah. matters. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because people do use God and not right now, especially as a weapon. And oh, right. they want homeostasis. If we could just get kick these Muslims out of our country, we'll be happy. Right. And they're the threat. So you have to, that's why I taught about each of those religions has a humanistic and ecumenical branch that's where the connection is and then it really is dedicated to creating communities right these higher order uh ways of operating um because when people are isolated they're living at a lower level of their capacities there's so many human capacities that are not triggered until you get into a complex like natural curiosity, artistic creativity. You have to have leisure and stability and all that stuff in order to free the mind up to develop some of its uh, really humane, humanistic capacities. Um, so, so that was where Laszlo ended up. Um, 
Ivy, did you have a reaction to that? I have a question um, to like clarify before, like when I was thinking about artificial, the artificial mind. So was he trying to say that our intelligence can be artificial based on what we've given, if that makes sense? Like how people in trauma, they are, they think they don't have any other option until you realize that you do or someone shows them that you do, if that makes sense? Sure, you gotta get to a higher level of, of complexity. You have to have a different concept of who you are. Does that make sense? Yes. Right, this isn't- So you need you a different are. perspective. And a higher order one, right? Uh -huh. You have to be able to see it from a higher perspective. Like you have to be able to believe that you're gonna be able to get over this and you can become a different person. And then there, I mean, what these guys are saying is physiologically, that is true, right? Mm -hmm. But it has to be thoughts causing thoughts. You have to be reflecting on it. You can't be denying it, repressing it, right? It's still driving you then. But if you reflect on it, so you turn the emotions into feelings, remember that? with mm -hmm. um, Damasio, and then you the feelings become an object of reflection, and then reflection within a community so you're not isolated. And then, right, you have a, you, you can create a, a new life. You can be a participating member in a community. You can, right, bind people together. You can link your religious community, Muslims and Christians together, can, and the higher levels it gets, the better you, the better off we are, and the more homeostasis we can have. But Mr. But it's just a long, long process of getting to higher and higher levels. Um, so Mr. Um, the thing about Davies in these readings is that he doesn't emphasize enough the place of community in um, the mind, right? Um, let me see where he says, your mental world it, it is a private universe. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it might be your own reflections, but they are a function. They're not a function necessarily of your external stimuli, emotions. They're mm -hmm. a function of thoughts with other people right? Interactions with other people on the basis of ideas. Does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So that, that transition, remember, he says, how does something go from just an outside stimuli to the sensation of sound? The sen he, what he means by sensation is that you're conscious of it. You're conscious that you're hearing it. Well, this is the same transition Damasio talks about when, how do you go from that emotion to a feeling where you're conscious of it, you tie it to consciousness, and then you can make it, move it forward, change actually how your brain is wired. Um, does that make sense to people? Did, um, did Warren have to leave? Yeah, he's gone. Okay. All right, but we can talk more if you want to. It's just I have you have class. to go. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll we can, we should talk more about this. I want you to to wrap it up in your mind. Post. <laughs> because the next one I have for Friday has to do with education. What should college? You yeah. Know, what should be we be learning in college? And and it's not this stuff, or it should be this stuff. And it's not this stuff kind of stuff. <laughs> okay? Okay. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.
Yeah. That's what you want. Yeah. Welcome to the real world. <laughs> Whoever told you we could get that much? 